Good evening, everyone. I think we can start little by little. Uh, first of all, I would like to make a, an announcement for those of you who are on Zoom. Could you please mute yourselves uh, so that uh, uh, the ones who are listening to us over Zoom can hear uh, us uh, much better? Um, so first of all, uh, it is great to see such a big crowd yeah, both in the Anamed Auditorium and also over Zoom at our very first talk for this academic year. Uh, for those of you who have not met me before, I'm Zeynep Simavi, Istanbul Branch Director of ARET, and I'm delighted to welcome you all. Uh, our speaker for tonight is a name that's well known quite, uh, that's, that's very well known to uh, the ARET circles, as well as for those of you who are interested in travel and also uh, to Turkey, uh, Pat Yale. Uh, she will be talking about her uh, book uh, following Miss Bell travels around Turkey in the footsteps of Gertrude Bell, which is just hot off the press. And we are thrilled to have her first book talk at Arit in Istanbul. Uh, Pat is a native of London and she studied history at Cambridge University. And then later on, she started to work at the travel industry. And of course, as a guidebook writer, she specialized in Turkey and she's been living in Turkey for more than two decades. Terrible. Most of the time was uh, in Cappadocia, but now she is a resident of Istanbul. And in her book, she's looking into the travels of Gertrude Bell in Turkey, in Turkey, which is a, quite an understudied topic. And in 2015 and 16, she followed her footsteps. And in her book, she is weaving uh, the travels of Gertrude Bell that is revealed from her diaries, letters, and published works with her own travels. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Pat. And after her lecture, we'll have plenty of time to ask her questions and discuss the book amongst ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Zainab. First of all, I want to thank you all for coming. That's very good to see you all here, including the people on Zoom. And then I'd also like to thank, uh, thank uh, the Friends of the American Research Institute for, for inviting me. And in particular to Zeynep Simavi for organizing everything and introducing me. And uh, also thank Anamed for providing the venue. Now, I know most of you know me, so you're probably fairly tired of listening to Gertrude Bell, actually. Um, this is a project that has taken up. Huh, nothing's moving on. When we were testing it, it was moving on. So we'd have to do it that way. Ah, thank you. I'll do it that way. Okay. Okay. So what I'm going to do this evening, I'm go um, Zainab has just introduced the project basically. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you. I think because most of you know quite a lot about Turkey, I'm going to start by talking about how this project actually <laughs> arose. I mean, I'm how going to I start by to talking about how this project got to in the first place, and how we went from I'm there. Sure. So to this, the finished product. So it took a very, very long time. It wasn't actually the um, doing the work that took the time, it, but finding a publisher and getting it published took an extremely long time. So I'm just gonna set the timer so I know how long I'm going on for. Okay, so let's get going. So this is from, this is, the, this, this project started in this building. So it's particularly happy for me that I'm ending up talking here. I'd had a very strange day back in 2014. I'd gone to Guhane Park and I'd petted a golden retriever that I'd seen there many times and it bit me. And the result was I had to spend all the rest of the day running around town trying to find the, hotel, the, the hospital that does the rabies jab. And about four o'clock in the evening, I got back to Istiklal and I was like, okay, now I'm going to calm down. And Anamed was showing an exhibition put on by the historian Edem Eldem, and it was about Nasli's guest book. Now, Nasla was the daughter of the very famous Osman Hamdi Bey, who's painting the tortoise trainer you probably all know in the Perra Museum. He was also an archeologist, a statesman, a museologist. He was a very important man. So I see amongst, completely out of the blue. So I'm looking at all these entries and I come to this one and it says, 
Our Mademoiselle Nasla, the most exalted seat in the world, is the saddle of a swift horse, and the best companion for all time is a book. And it's a quotation from an Iraqi poet, and when I looked at who'd signed, it was Gertrude Lothian Bell. Now, this had a tremendous impact on me, because looking at it, I was thinking, well, if you were a British person, even if you were a wealthy, even if you were from a wealthy family, if you were on a first trip to Istanbul, which was then Constantinople, you probably didn't go to Osman Hamdi Bey's house because he was such an important man. So that signature implied to me, and we don't know that when it was written, but probably 1907, it implied to me that she must have been to Constantinople before then. And so I started down what became a bit of a rabbit hole for me to try and find out the story. So I'm, I'm assuming that most of you possibly at least know her name. You possibly have seen Nicole Kidman play her in The Queen of the Desert, which is not a very good film, but anyway. Um, but just in case, I'm just gonna summarize the, the basic facts of her life. So she was born Gertrude Margaret Lothian Bell and she was born in Washington in the north of the UK, which means that she's sometimes described as an Anglo-American, although, of course, she's nothing of the sort. It's just that Washington is a place in the UK as well as in the States. She traveled very extensively in the Middle East, so she's mainly known for traveling in Iraq, Syria, um, Israel, Palestine, Saudi Arabia, Beirut. And the fact that she is so famous for that, those travels, I think, has obscured the time that she spent in Turkey and how actually significant that would have been if she hadn't done all these other things as well. So she'd written, she wrote several books, including two that are actually about Turkey, although they are very academic books, very difficult to actually read as books. Um, according to my research, she visited Turkey at least 11 times between 1889 and 1914. As far as I can see, her last visit was in 1914, before the war. The war divided her life into two parts. After the war, she moved to Baghdad, and as far as I can tell, never came back to Turkey at all. She's also sometimes famous for being a friend of Lawrence of Arabia, who eclipsed her in the fame stakes. She was more famous than him in her lifetime, but I think due to Peter O'Toole's beautiful blue eyes, she was completely erased from the story. But she also met um, the love of her life. She met him in Konya, Dick Doughty Wiley, who was the British consul in Konya at that time. Um, she didn't have a very happy love life. Her first, the first person she fell in love with, her parents wouldn't allow her to marry because they thought he couldn't support her in the, in the status she was used to. And then he fell in a river, contracted pneumonia and died. So there was never any time to change their mind. Then she fell in love with Dick Doughty Wiley, who was already married. And I mean, I, I think in Edwardian society, it's questionable whether they would ever have been able to make a life from that, but he was killed at Gallipoli. So, and I personally think she never really recovered from that. Anyway, she died in Baghdad in July, 1926, aged only 58, almost certainly, not 100% certainly, but almost certainly, from suicide from sleeping pills. So having seen this signature in the guest book, I started thinking, and I vaguely remembered that when I visited this remarkable mid-Byzantine church, the Jan the Khaleesi Church with the Bell near Aksaray, that I did remember having heard that Gertrude Bell had been there and complained that she only had three hours to look at it. So that was a stage in my discovery um, her journey. Then I remembered that she had also been to Bimbir Khaleesi. Bimbir Khaleesi is a fairly remote place near Karaman, also in central Anatolia. And Gertrude actually spent six weeks there, sort of excavating, but mainly cleaning the churches there. I mean, those of you who know Turkish knows that Bimbir Khaleesi means a thousand and one churches, hence the title of the book. But in fact, there were only ever 28 churches there. And I think they use bin beer in the way that we use 101. So I might say, I've got 101 reasons I didn't get something done. So I think that was just uh, the way they talked. And then inside that particular book, I found this very peculiar thing, the lost church of St. Amphilochius in Konya, 
which started life, if you look at the bottom part of it, as a Byzantine church. That was converted into a mesjet at some point. And then later on, a clock tower was added onto the top, probably in the early 20th century. Now, I know Konya pretty well, and I've never seen any sign of this church. It turns out it was blown up in 1921. But slowly, the picture that was forming in my mind was that she had been to a lot of places. And why was this not well known? Why wasn't there any record of this? Why didn't everybody know this? So then I looked at her three travel books. And if you look at the one on the left-hand side, Persian pictures, I defy anyone to assume that that would be one third at least about Turkey. So I think in one way, her story was in plain sight, but in another way, it was disguised among, behind misleading things. The one on the right-hand side, the desert and zone, is her story of traveling in um, Syria, Israel, Palestine, um, Lebanon. But she comes back into Turkey at the end of that trip, and she came back through Antakya. So her account now of Antakya has additional poignancy after what happened in February, um, when so much of that historic city was destroyed. So the next step, obviously, and possibly the first, what should have been the first step, was to go to the Gertrude Bell archive. After Gertrude died in 1926, all her papers, her photos and everything was donated to Newcastle University and all her papers were transcribed first and then digitalized. So now it's an incredible archive of materials for people interested in um, the early 20th century. This picture, believe it or not, is Konya in 1907. So those of you who know Konya, I don't think that's the picture you would have in your mind of Konya, but it is Konya in 1907. And it was here in Konya that Gertrude met Dick Doughty Wiley here on the right hand side, looking quite spivvy in my opinion, who was already mar married to Lillian here on, on the left. And he was the consul. In those days, there were consuls all over the country. There was the ambassador in Ankara, well, no, sorry, the ambassador in Constantinople, Istanbul, and then all around the country where there were trading matters to organize, there were con uh, consuls. And he, although he was a war hero, was actually serving as the consul. So I began to realize that although the story of Gertrude in Turkey is mostly about place and geography and where she went, but it is also about people as well, which is obviously very important. And this here is the young Lawrence of Arabia. Uh, on the right in these not very fetching shorts. And this is at Karkamush, which is a, an archaeological site that to this day is partly in Syria and partly in Turkey. So I could not get permission to actually go to the site, but the Italian archeologists who were working there in 2014, which is when I went there, um, accommodated me for the night. And I could sit in the courtyard and wash, Syrian, uh, wash his like, pottery while they went off to do their digging. And at that time, ISIS was one kilometer away across the border. So these archeologists, were working away on this site, partly in Syria, while ISIS was just down the road. So at this point, what I did was I went through the archive and I marked on the map every place that I could identify that Gertrude had been to. And you end up with this map here. And you'll see at the top uh, left hand corner. On her first couple of visits, it was all about Istanbul. Constantinople, Bursa and Troy, and nothing else. She was a tourist, same as all, all of us were when we first came here. But then afterwards, she started sailing into Izmir, which was then Smyrna, and traveling the route that I've shown there. And that route, it, this is an amalgam of all her routes. It is not the route she did. It's the amalgam of all that what I could identify and which I then joined up in order that I would be able to follow it. But if you look, it comes right out over here to Silopi Jizre on the borders of Syria and Iraq, um, which was it, which is always a very troubled area. It goes down into the Hatay. It goes right across the middle of the country, east and west. And the red line on the um, east side is actually on the west side. It's a little bit deceptive because that's just, just the train journey that you would make back from Konya through Eskishahir to Constantinople. But as you can see, she's traveled a very large part of the country. 
for it to be so little known, basically. Sorry, where have I done that? I've done something. Well, that will work. Okay, now it, it was difficult to know what to talk about to people here, most of whom know Turkey very well. So I thought what I would do is start by talking about where she was near us, very near us, in Meshruti at Jardasi. So in 1870, there'd been a great fire in Pera, and in the space that was cleared, a string of stone-built um, modern hotels went up, of which the Pera Palace is the most famous. But Gertrude, in 1889, on her first visit, when she came here from, I believe, from Romania, from Bucharest, she stayed at the hotel, oh, I've lost it. <clears throat> yes, screen sharing. Sorry. Okay, please. Give us a few minutes once we... So it looks like we're still sharing it. Is it going to be done? Yeah. Or at least it's not showing it on the uh, well, if we do this. We are back. We've got it back. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So this here on the left hand side is the original hotel that was on the site of the Rixus Pera here. So that obviously it doesn't exist anymore, but that was where Gertrude stayed when she first came in 1889. And so she had a fine view of the Golden Horn and she was right in the heart of things. And she was most importantly, right beside the British Embassy. So she was a guest of the British Embassy. <coughs> so when you're looking at that Rixus Hotel, you want to think that that's where the Queen of the Desert started her travels in the Middle East. This is the Hotel Bristol, which is now the Pera Museum. Uh, which is obviously well known to us. The interior is completely gutted to turn it into a museum. But that on the left is what it looked like in Gertrude's days, and she stayed there as well. She also stayed in this, which is now the Salab Ojaya, just down the road from the other two hotels, but was then the Hotel Continental. And is obviously waiting a saviour, who hopefully will come eventually. I haven't, I'm not bothered with a picture of the Pera Palace. Eventually she stayed at the Pera Palace. And once she stayed there, she didn't go anywhere else after that. That was her bolt hole. But we all know the Pera Palace, so I'm not going to worry about that. Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about things that she did in Istanbul. And here we have, obviously, Hagia Sophia, Sophia that started life as Hagia Sophia, the great, great Byzantine church, and is now Hagia Sophia Mosque. But when Gertrude was here, it was also a mosque. And she was lucky enough to visit um, during Ramadan, during Ramadan, and she was able to sit up in the gallery and look down on all the crowds that had assembled on Kadir Gechisi, the day of destination, when everybody goes to the mosque and stays there overnight. Well, everybody, a lot of people, men, go and stay overnight in the mosque. Um, but she was able to sit in the gallery and observe that and write about it in that book, Persian Pictures, which sounds as if it's a book about Iran, but is in fact also about Turkey. Now, this is one of Gertrude's own photographs, and this is what we know of as the Kariye Jami, the Korea, Korea Church, very well known for its beautiful um, frescoes. But look at the difference. I mean, you cannot take that photograph now because now it is entirely hemmed in with buildings. But at the time that Gertrude saw it, it was standing in countryside. So that's obviously a very valuable photograph um, of its state then. Okay, so the 19th century tourist trail. So in my opinion, my analysis of the situation is that Gertrude, when she first came here, was a tourist, the same as we all were when we first came here. She didn't have any prior knowledge. She was only 19, she was 19 when she came for the first time. But I think what, what is quite important is to try to put yourself in the frame of mind of a 19 year old, young Victorian woman who'd been brought up, you know, in a secluded sort of atmosphere, always accompanied, never allowed to go anywhere alone. Um, and then she arrived in Constantinople. And I mean, I remember my first visit to Istanbul and what a shock it was. And yet by then, when I came in 1974, 
of course, we had access to TV and films. It was still a terrible shock. So you have to try and imagine what it was like in 1889 when you had none of that. So you just arrive in the city. And as I understand, she came by ship from uh, Bucharest, which was fairly westernized and uh, rather French. And then she arrived here. So she had with her, I put it there to show you, the Murray's Guidebook. So this is a, a 19, this is an 1892 edition of the Murray's Guidebook uh, that she would have been using. She was very attached to Murray's Guidebooks. And if you look over on the right-hand side, if you can actually see it, it says Turkish sweetmeats, and it lists Haji Bekir, which we are all familiar with because it's down opposite the Ottoman Legacy Hotel in Sukeji. So, she was a tourist when she first came here, and then she became this great traveler. But it all started, as far as I'm concerned, here in Istanbul with her first vision of what um, the Muslim world was like. And to be honest, one of the reasons that probably drew me to this story was I came here for the first time when I was 20, and it was my first exposure to the Islamic world. So in that sense, I think, obviously, I had more to go on before I came, but I think there's that parallel between our experiences. <clears throat> okay, now what I'm gonna do is look very briefly at a few places that are familiar to people so that you know we, we're not lost. So this is obviously Ephesus. Um, Gertrude came four times to Ephesus at, at different times. Um, all I would say about this is that I arrived there on April the 23rd, which is a public holiday. It was absolutely heaving with people. I'd not ever, it was unbearable and I didn't know what to do. So what I did was I got somebody to drop me on the walls that surround Ephesus, thinking that way I could be on my own. I could look down and I could think about things. What actually happened was I got lost. I got stranded on the walls. I could not find the way back nor the way forward. And I had to be ignominiously rescued from these walls. I had to phone someone to rescue me. And that is the only time. So this is Ephesus where we've all been. And that was the only time that I actually had to be rescued. I mean, I went to all these much more frightening places. Nothing like that ever happened there. This is Bergama, again, very familiar to all of you, I'm sure, with that incredible theater. But she did also go to some less well-known classical sites. So this is Lagina near Milas, which is a temple, has a temple to Hecate, the goddess of crossroads and witchcraft and black magic generally. And Osman Hamdi Bey had excavated this and Gertrude went to visit it. Obviously, so did I. Um, so she saw what was so impressive when I really looked at what she'd done. She'd done all the well-known things that we all do. But on top of that, she'd done all these other things that we don't do. So that was what made discovering her journey so exciting for me. So this is Blaundos near Ushak. Again, it's, an, it's a remarkable site, but very little visited. It's recently been, I think, restored. So perhaps it will attract more visitors now. The taxi drivers in Ushak didn't know where it was. So we had to sort of manage with me guiding them. Um, so this is, I think, what makes her special, that she saw what we all see, but she also saw the things that we don't see, even then, back at that date. And then this one, of course, we all know, Bodrum Castle. So the quotation there is that she wrote to um, Dick Doughty Wiley, the man that she was in love with, literally a few days before he was killed at Gallipoli. And in that, she's reminding him I rode across the bay and walked over the isthmus. Then I walked and rode back. I believe that she took a boat from Guluk to Torba in the north of the peninsula, walked across the peninsula, then looked at all the sites, then walked back across the peninsula and took the boat back to Guluk. And that, is, that actually tells you what kind of a woman she was. Most of us would not think of doing all that in one day, but she did and then moved on the next day to something else. She was a very, very sturdy, determined woman. Okay, that's the sort of easy, very familiar, everybody has seen it before, sort of things to talk about. But I want to also talk about some of the places that some of you will know and some of you won't. So this is Shan Ufa in the southeast. Incredibly fantastic place. Um, as you can see there, that really, really beautiful um, holy site there. <laughs> um, Gertrude's notes on Ufa are not, not the best, but she definitely went there. 
I was there in Ramazan in 2015. So that was in July in 2015, and people were fasting for 17 hours in the day, and the temperature was on average 45 degrees. It was terrible. It was incredible. I'll never, ever forget the experience, but it was also terrible. And after 10 days, I realized I couldn't do what I was there to do because I couldn't possibly talk to anyone at 10 o'clock in the morning who couldn't drink anything in those temperatures until nine at night. So eventually I stopped and had a break and went back. But I want to show you, I, I think this is a rather remarkable photograph that I took in Ramazan in 2015 in Ufa, where everybody is fasting, like 99% of people there are fasting. They make it very difficult for you not to fast by, for example, removing the chairs and tables in places where people assemble to sit. So everybody's fasting in this incredible heat. So I discovered that in the evening, not the women, obviously, but the men and the young boys would go to this mosque where normally you would just walk through and there would just be this stretch of water and they would sit there with their feet in the water, trying to cool down. Um, it, it was a very magical experience, even though I couldn't actually achieve very much and had to break the journey and then come back when Ramazan was over, but it was an unforgettable experience. This, perhaps some people have seen it, maybe not. If you've been to Mardin, this is the ruins at Dara. This is a quarry that most of the stone that was used to build Mardin came from. Um, and Gertrude was there. And <clears throat> in the ruins here, I was just talking to this, this man here, whose name is, get it right, Hamza Kaya, who runs the cafe there. And, you know, I was looking at this rather impressive capital there. And I was telling him what, what I was doing. And he said, my grandfather guided Gertrude. So that was one of those moments when time stood still. And he didn't, I think he probably really meant his great grandfather. I think it would have to have been further back than that. And he rushed off into his house and came back with a local guidebook that had just been printed with Gertrude's pictures illustrating it. Um, he didn't, he couldn't tell me anything, but he, in his family memory, Gertrude Bell was still alive. So that is at Dara near Mardin. And then this area I'm going to talk to you about because in some ways it's one of the most important bits of Gertrude's life. So you have to think the same person who visited Ephesus like we all do, also visited the Tur Abdin where very few of us ever go. And it's a distant part of Turkey. It's around Midiat, you can see in the middle there, which is quite near Mardin. But certainly in 2015, nobody was going there because the... Um, the political situation in the second half of 2015 was not good. Security was unraveling very fast. I had to go there because it was crucial to Gertrude's story because she actually, one of her two books that she wrote about Turkey is about the churches and monasteries of the Turab Din. So in a way, she was the sort of formative person who wrote about the Turab Din. So this is perhaps the best known of the very many churches in the Turandin. And it's in a village called, it, it, its local name is Ha in the local Syriani dialect, but its Turkish name is Anukla. And on the left-hand side, you can see Gertrude's photograph that she took, she was camping right beside it. And then on the right, you'll see my photograph. So the dome has since disappeared. So her photographs are a very valuable source of information for how buildings were at a previous time, that you know, there are not many other sources for this, because even though quite a lot of uh, European travelers did travel across to this part of, um, of Turkey, they, not many of them photographed anything. Even if they wrote, they didn't photograph. So her photographs are an invaluable archive. Now, this is a couple that I became very fond of. On the left is, his name is Abdullah, and on the right is his wife, his wife, Nishani. And they are two thirds, or they were then two thirds of the surviving Suriani population of a village called Mejimekli in the Turab Din. The Turab Din was mainly populated by Syrian Orthodox people at the time, but most of that population was either driven out or killed during the troubles of the 1915. So they 
they have somehow managed to continue living there. I unfortunately, I doubt very much if Nishani is still alive because the last I heard of her, she was very frail and very unwell. But her husband, Abdullah, was a very sturdy person. Um, and the wonderful thing was I went with a taxi driver from, taxi drivers form a big part of my book if you ever get to read it. I went with a taxi driver from Midiat and he spoke to them in Arabic and I spoke to them in Turkish and they spoke to each other in Turoyo, which is the local variant of, um, oh, it's going to escape me now. Anyway, it's very ancient, oh, it'll come back to me in a minute, very ancient biblical language, Turoyo. So it was quite interesting to sit in their room and these three languages are happening simultaneously. Um, and when I first went, I went with um, Nishani to look at the, there's two churches there and one has the base of a stylite column in it, which you know, there's not many of those in Turkey. I went with um, Nishani the first time and then she was in her seventies, but she was still able to climb over the wall because we found the gate locked. So she climbed over the wall while I'm standing there going, oh, what are we going to do now? Um, and went in to unlock the gate so that I could sail through in comfort. But by the time I went back again, um, she was not well enough to do that. And it, I went with her husband the second time. Anyway, remarkable people. Meeting them was a delight. Now this is, is um, the monastery of Moor Algen. It's a very remote monastery near New Saibin. Um, from the Syriac tradition. And this was a very difficult visit because by the time I got there, um, unfortunately, the security situation in Eastern Turkey had very much unraveled. If, if any of you remember 2015, we had an election in April that didn't really go the way it was expected to go. So the government decided to rerun the election. And what had been a quite a peaceful situation started to unravel. So whereas in July, when I left Urfa, because it was too hot and people were fasting and there was nothing to do, by the time I came back in September to Urfa, tourists had completely vanished and the security situation was extremely tense. Um, I think because I live here, I could deal with that. Um, but otherwise, I think you know most tourists just gave up on that. And by the time I got to New Saibin, which is the town you go to to get to this monastery, it was extremely tense, and most of New Saibin had big barriers up around it, and um, yeah, it was not, not a very easy situation, but I got a taxi that took me up to this monastery, and there I met these two men. On the right is Father Joe Arkin, who's a very brave man who's worked very hard to restore this church to its current good state of repair, and on the left, left is Father Dale Johnson, who is an American, um, he's one of two American Syrian Orthodox priests. And he had heard a rumor that this strange British woman was roaming around the Turabdin, visiting the churches and asking questions, and he'd waited to meet me. So that was a very nice encounter. And I'm looking at the time, how much time have we got? I think we've probably got time. If it's all right with you, I'm going to read you a little piece from the book about the meeting with Dale Johnson, if that's all right. Okay. If I can find it, I'll do it. Okay, so Dale, this is Dale Johnson talking to me. Look up there, see that cave. That's where the bishop was living when Gertrude came here, says Father Dale Johnson. I'm in luck. Not only is Father Joe Arkin at home, but I've arrived during a visit by Dale one of only two ordained Syrian Orthodox priests in the USA. A brave and resourceful man at the tipping point between middle and old age, Dale has devoted much of his life to helping refugees, paying for his own ventures in benighted parts by being taken hostage twice. Now like Jaokin, he's conscious that the, minute, the hand stands at a minute to midnight for Christianity in the Turab Din. He's also another big Gertrude fan. By now, word of a strange English woman who is retracing her doubtful travels is doing the rounds of the Turabdin monasteries, and he has been waiting to greet me. More Albion was a little busier in Gertrude's day. Ten monks were lodged in the rock-cut cells of their remote forerunners, she wrote, and she was greeted by the prior, a man of about 30, with melancholy eyes and a face marked with the lines drawn by solitude and hunger. 
Soon he was explaining their work, way of life to her. They spend their days in meditation. Their diet is bread and oil and lentils. No meat and neither meat, milk nor eggs may pass their lips. They may see no woman. At that last remark, Gertrude let out a squeak. But may you see me, I asked. The prior replied that they'd made an exception for her since they had so few visitors. Still, some of the monks have shut themselves into their cells until you go. As for the bishop, when Gertrude asked to see him, she was told that he had left the world, a statement that turned out to be code for his having retreated to the cave once occupied by Moore Algin himself, that Dale is now pointing out to me some 50 feet above the ground. He is the father of 80 years, and it is now a year since he took a vow of silence and renounced the world. Once a day at sunset, he lets down a basket on a rope and we place therein a small portion of bread. When he is sick to death, he will send down a written word telling us to come up and fetch his body, the prior explained. I peer up at that cave, its mouth partially stopped up with stone. It's hard to believe that men were ever content to subject themselves to such privations. But the prior made plain to Gertrude that he anticipated the same future for himself. The idea has some romantic appeal to me too, admits Dale. Is it okay to talk to women now? I asked Joachim, suddenly self-conscious. A gentle smile lifts the corners of his lips. After the ferment, everything changed, he says quietly. Together we wander around what Gertrude called the most striking monastery in the Tur Abdin, a kind of citadel in the heart of a system of monastic fortifications. Joachim and Dale show me the tomb of Mor Algin, a Red Sea pearl fisherman and purported disciple of St. Anthony of Egypt, who is believed to have arrived here with a large following and established the monastery. I'm also shown a sealed niche containing the bones of Gertrude's unseen bishop. Joachim snaps a picture of Dale and me standing exactly the same spot as Gertrude herself had been photographed. Then we progress into the dimly lit church. In a moment of sheer poetry, I light a candle for Gertrude, while behind me, Dale and Joachim quietly recite the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic. Okay, so moving on, this is Diabaka, which many of you will know. Um, and Diabaka, at the time that I visited, was in a very tense situation. Um, young men had actually occupied much of the old city, and they had black blocked the, the walls with rocks and hung curtains down so that you couldn't see what was happening behind them. Um, I didn't at first know quite what to do about this, but obviously I stayed a few days and your courage builds up until eventually you feel able to pass behind a barrier and talk to the young men behind it. Um, but it was a little bit difficult. Now these are, this is part of the ruins of the old walls of Diabaka, which many of you will have seen. And they have become a world heritage, heritage site along with this, the Hefsel Gardens, um, which when I was there was still fine. I, I don't know what state they're in now. And this, then any of you who've been to Diabaka will have probably been to the Hassan Pasha Han in the center of town where people gather to drink tea, eat large breakfasts, um, generally enjoy themselves. But what you have to think is that when Gertrude was there, that was a stable and that's where she stabled her horses. So where we would now sit having a cup of tea is where she would have put her horses. And then, <clears throat> This is one of Gertrude's own photographs. She spent nearly a week in Diabaka photographing the monuments that survived. And this is now um, the Ulujami, but it started life as a, a seventh century church. And that wall at the back there that you see is part of the original church. Okay, so I'm skipping to Cappadocia, which obviously some of you here know very well. And this is Mount Hassan. You can see that uh, my main mode of transport for remote areas was taxi. So I got to know lots of taxi drivers. So Mount Hassan is 3,268 3, meters, which is 10,721 feet. So it's an actual mountain. And you can see that it's snow covered there. Gertrude climbed that mountain, which meant I had to have a go at climbing it. She had also climbed Mount Judy in the southeast. I was saved from having to copy that by the fact that security means you simply would not be allowed to go up there. Mount Hassan is in Cappadocia. Therefore, there was no possibility that I could refuse to try to climb this mountain. And the upshot is me sitting on the mountain 
near the summit, but alas, not quite at the summit, 300 meters short of the summit, the mountain guide said to me that he thought we had to turn back. There's no actual path. You just pick your, you pick your way over the rocks. So Gertrude always beat me. So Gertrude definitely got to the top. And actually, except that I don't have a good enough copy of it, I, there is a photograph of her guides on the summit of Hassandar. I got to within 300 meters of the top, but then had to walk, go back because they didn't think that we could get there and back in what was left of the day. Okay, so that brings us back to very familiar to us all, Sikechi Station. Uh, my book starts in Sikechi Station. It starts with the dervishes whir uh, whirling in the waiting room, which actually doesn't seem to be happening anymore since COVID. Um, but Gertrude left in 1914 from Sikechi Station. So that's her farewell to Turkey. So it's very important. Uh, of course, now it's all covered in scaffolding. But I want to also show you this. This is the grave of Doughty Wiley in Gallipoli, where he was killed 26th of April, 1915. So when I went to see his grave, I was doing that not so much following Gertrude as for Gertrude. And all I could find to leave was this couple of flowers in the front. But for me, it was a very important thing to have to do that because although one of the, um, the biographies kind of suggests they think she went there, but the other one doesn't, and I believe the one who says that she never saw his grave, and yet it coloured the rest of her life. Okay, well, thank you very much for listening, and that's that. And I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has, as long as they're not about Iraq or Sibley. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Pat, and I'm sure there are multiple questions, so maybe we can start... Uh with the uh, um, auditorium participants and I will be also checking uh, for the uh, Zoom questions. And for those of you who are joining us via Zoom, uh, you can either raise your hand or you can also type it on the chat. I'll be happy to read it out. But Pat, please, you'll be, <laughs> you'll be using the microphone more than okay. I did. Okay, maybe while people are waiting here, we already have one from uh, Zoom. Uh, I'm disappointed that you couldn't climb Judy, though. Do you have plans to return? Well, I certainly have plans to return because that's out at uh, New Saiban area. Um, but whether I, I mean, five or six years have passed now, I doubt whether I would physically now be able to climb Judy Dar. I mean, I could not get quite to the top of the other mountain. Um, and the security around Judy Dar, I, I suspect, remains quite tense. Uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I have a question about her visiting the ancient sites on the uh, west of the country, such as Bagama and Epes. Were they were those sites being excavated at the time? And did she have any information about those excavations? Or you know, met many of the works that were uh, later moved to Berlin and you know London. Were they still? presence and was she able to see that in that form original form well i don't i don't think she would have seen it in the way that we see those places because so much work has been done since um i'm sometimes a bit shocked when i think i've seen seen something she saw and i realize that she would have actually seen all the columns lying on the ground whereas in fact they've now all been put upright so for example um i don't so sorry so what, what exactly did you want to I'm sorry, I'm just curious if she described those sites in detail of what she was seeing, like the structures or um, no. some of the works that were transitioning. No, she didn't. The, the Gertrude who went to um, Ephesus and Bergamo was a young woman, so a woman in her 20s, and she was interested in these places and she went to visit them, but I don't think she had any vision that she was ever going to do anything with this. She was just visiting more or less as we do. There aren't even any photographs surviving of the Bergamo, I don't think of the FS visit either. Um, so she wasn't even a photographer at that point. So you're left with the diaries, which are really quite um, slight. And sometimes when she's particularly impressed with the letters home to her family. Um, but that that's really all. So of the, I know that she went to all these sites in the West, but we have less information about those visits than we do about the ones to the East, by which time she was an archeologist herself. And, more interesting. 
Uh, we have one question from Zoom about the type of camera Gertrude Bell used for her Ooh. photographs. Oh, you know? I can't answer that. No, uh, sorry. Maybe I don't the Nip Castle archives? The uh, Newcastle archive might know. Mom, I don't know. They may yeah. have the camera. Well, mm, not that I'm aware of, but, okay. but that I don't actually know. Okay, and there's also one request, actually. It would be great if those of us on Zoom could see the uh, people seated at Anamet. <laughs> so if you're okay with it, I'm going to be adventurous, turn on my uh, camera and maybe try to show you. Would you be all right? Okay, let me let me start my video here and see whether... <laughs> okay, everyone's waiting. <laughs> okay, I can see them. Uh, well, if I don't we know if you stop can, sharing, yeah. maybe. Well, if we oh stop God. sharing your streets, stop share. Let's try. Okay. Oh, uh, do you need, I guess, Murat Bey here? Yes. I don't know how you show them all as opposed to just one. Yeah. If we do. Is there any evidence she learned Turkish? No? Yes, yeah, she, she did. She did. Yes. So she spoke six languages. And Turkish was the seventh that she tried, but she said that it didn't stick. But there are references in her diaries and her letters. She uses Turkish words sometimes when it's the most appropriate. Yeah. But but I think it didn't stick in the way that the other five languages on, on top of English. She was really someone who spoke Arabic predominantly yeah. and a bit of Farsi. Well, quite a lot of Farsi. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a question. And I'm still reading it, but she was very many families and mothers presumably. And families and relatives were not told me in this way. Was she recording this thing? Well, one of the things that, that is, there's a bit of a misunderstanding about Gertrude Bell, I and mean, people imagine her as this solitary traveler. In fact, she was never alone. She always had an entourage of people, porters guards, um, people looking after her stuff, putting up the tents, taking them down, uh, you know, cooking the dinner and all the rest of it. I mean, sometimes, you know, she had a manservant called Fatu and there'll be the description of Fatu is cooking dinner and she's, for example, swimming in Lake Eirdir while he's doing that. Um, so, I mean, the amazing thing was that she did this alone and in all these remote areas. It, I mean, that she did it at all and she did it by whatever mode of transport was available, usually horse. Um, but she did always have an entourage and she did actually have a gun as well. Not that I'm aware she ever used it. Thank you for the uh, talk. Thanks. Really awesome. um, my question is in the beginning, you mentioned um, the reference to Osman and Dibe. Um, is there any evidence? out um, other figures that she may have met or encountered um, in this period of her time. Well, the truth of the matter is, if you read her diaries and her letters, she met all the great and good of late Ottoman society. Certainly not, not in 1889, but by 1914, she was a famous person and everyone wanted to meet her. And so, you know, she often always says that, you know, everybody was waiting to meet me mm -hmm. and then lists a whole long list of people. Often some you can very easily identify, some not necessarily. So that's an area of work that I would you know, still be quite interested in doing, trying to um, encounter, to, to interpret who some of these people were. Um, but yes, yeah, so Osman Hamdi Bey, she went to his house in, which was in Kuru Um it doesn't survive now and it, no one is, seems to be entirely 100% certain where it is. It's near the Lays Ottoman Hotel, it was around there. Um, but she went to his house and I assume that that's where she probably wrote in the visitor. I mean, I, I can't prove that, can I? But I assume that's where she wrote in the visitor's book mm -hmm. that started all this off. Um, but you see pictures of Osman Hamdi Bey in a sort of rose covered house in Kuru Cheshme. And I imagine that was where that was. But there's still a lot of work to be done, particularly on an unraveling who was who. Sorry, I'm going to ask another one. I was wondering if there's one specific location that 
really stick out to you of all the places that you went that really made your jaw drop and if you could share that with us. Well, I, I probably should say, which I didn't say before, is I was a guidebook writer for Turkey. So I had visited most of these places any number of times before. So to that extent, I couldn't very easily get the first time impact that people would get when they see them for the first time. So I think Ufa, being in Ufa during Ramazan, when the temperature was 45, was a completely unforgettable experience. I mean, it was just seeing everybody fasting and yet that is, you know, it's one thing fasting in Istanbul, it's another thing fasting in Urfa. Um, and that was certainly for me a very, very memorable kind of experience. Um, I mean, most of it was just an endless succession of, of joy in discovering these places and being able to re-identify where she went. Um, and I suppose I've probably shown you things that had particular meaning for me. Um, I lived for a long time, as some people know, here in Cappadocia. I lived for 18 years in Cappadocia. Um, what was a little bit disappointing is Gertrude never, I lived in Gurame. Gertrude never went to Gurame because at the time that she was traveling, the road would have gone over the Taurus Mountains and up through Aksarai. Um, so it didn't go anywhere near Gurame or what is now the Cappadocia that most people go to. Um, so that was a little bit disappointing for me that she didn't actually visit the places that I knew the best, although I did know Cappadocia. And it was, for example, visiting the Alara Gorge and thinking of her there was you know, very rewarding for me because it was somewhere that we all knew very well, those of us who lived in Cappadocia. Uh, we have uh, one question. Uh, did Gertrude reflect either in letters or diaries about what it was like being an English woman traveling in Turkey with a small entourage of male porters, etc. Interestingly, she didn't very much. I mean, Gertrude did seem to have a great ability. To an extent, I have the same ability, I think. She had the great ability to say, I am not in England now, I'm here, and put England out of her mind, even though she did write very regularly to her family. Um, but there wasn't much of that kind of reflection, really. When she was in Turkey, she was in Turkey, yeah, completely, really. And I mean, if you think about it, I mean, why, you know, the, the sheer effort required to be traveling in these areas would have taken up all your energy and, you know, made it very difficult for you to think about anything much else. I mean, you were eating, you know, unfamiliar things. Sometimes it wasn't even very easy to find food. I mean, when she was at Bimbir Kalise, Fatu, her manservant, was out there trying to shoot um, you know, pheasants and things or whatever to, for food. I mean, I mean, it's not that they didn't get food, but it was not, you didn't just go down to Carrefour and buy, you know, a nice packaged thing of meat. You actually had to get your food from somewhere. So I think she was very immersed in where she was. And I think that was one of her great abilities, really, to be immersed like that. Any other questions before we wrap up? Uh, so maybe I guess we can tell that for those of you who are in Istanbul, you can get the book from the German bookstore, which is like literally a few blocks down the street from here, right next to the General Council of Sweden. And maybe since you're uh, you know, traveling to UK, would you like to give the dates and of your book talks in the UK for those who are <laughs> there. Yes, this I, is a quite an international group. Maybe you know some of them can also catch you in person. Well, the 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 official launch of this book in the UK, because it's published in the UK, will be at Stanford's, which is London's travel bookshop, on the twenty first of September, which is, is which is very nice for me. I'm also going to talk in Leicester, just because I happen to spend a lot of time in Leicester, and then I'm also going to go to Newcastle, where the archive is, um, to do some work on the archive uh, to identify some of the places that they can't identify and um, probably talk, talk at the university there at the same time. So okay. thank you very much for Thanks. coming and for listening. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I am ending this soon.